Welcome to Studio 5. We've got an inspired show to share. Singer, author, and television host Sheila Walsh is with us. Journalist and author Carrie Lloyd has advice and a guide to bring you and your loved ones closer together. And the story of Japanese pilot Mitsuo Fuchida's transformation following the attack on Pearl Harbor. We want to begin with Sheila Walsh. The CBN family know her as a former co-host of The 700 Club. Today, she is a speaker author. Her books also include a devotional called The Gifts of Christmas. She shares its inspiration in Studio 5 and her personal battle with clinical depression and some wisdom we can all use as we begin this new year. I need a wide shot of four coming back. I need music, Bill. Yeah, I need music on four. It's the 700 Club. Delighted to have all of you with us today, and we're delighted to have Sheila Walsh. I believe that almost everything we see around us is a picture of something spiritually. How many books have you written so far? I know it's over seven. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> Of all that, you've never written a Christmas book until no, now? No, never. What made you say, okay, now is the time? I think it was everything that's happened over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of devastating things going on that are not always reported. So I thought, how do you still maintain hope and joy with the reality of this is what's going on? And the only way that is possible is if we rediscover the wonder of the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then when this season has passed and we are entering a new year, how do you hang on? Look back and thank God, but look forward with expectancy. And to me, there's a difference between expecting something and living with expectancy because of someone mm. and realizing that Christ has gone ahead and that every year I expect new things. I always take everything I do, whether it's writing or speaking or television, and I lay it out on the table. And my thing is, okay, Lord, that was your plan last year. Is this still your plan? And how did you arrive at that wisdom? Because people are watching and seeing that thinking, it's beautiful, but how do I get there? I'm old. <laughs> I've been broken. I've been crushed. I've been filled with shame. But when you change where you're looking, if you're just looking in the mirror, that can be overwhelming. But if you're looking up, it can change everything. Is there a breaking point for you that did that? Mm, yeah, I went from being the co-host of the 700 Club one morning. By that evening, I'm in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital. We're so glad you're here. May I make an official welcome? Thank you. I'm welcome. thrilled to be here. Diagnosed with severe clinical depression. And that's where my father died by suicide when he was 34. And I remember thinking, well, this is the end of the story. But I discovered that even though even if you've committed yourself to a psych hospital, you can't leave for 72 hours and no one could come. I was there for a month. Mm. But I discovered that the Lamb of God checked himself in with me and I was not alone. I love that. I love that. I was looking at your website and saw some steps that you offer for, for people struggling. Um, the top begins, okay, doesn't live here, but Jesus does. And then I just want to go through each one of these steps real quick and get sure. your sort of illumination for them. The first one is take the first step. Yeah, and for me, that was telling God everything. And so that to me is taking the first step. It's being very honest with God and not thinking, okay, well, I have to kind of clean myself up to come to Him. No, you don't. You come as you are. Admit that you're stuck and struggling. Yeah, I always thought this is my fault. So a lifetime will not be long enough to weigh, to, to make the scales balance. And so I, I had to do that. I had to say, God, I want to live differently. I do not know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And just even admitting that you're stuck and struggling can be very liberating. Change the way you think. Yeah, change the way you think. I remember my mom used to love wallpaper. We don't do wallpaper as much <laughs> as we used yeah. to. Um, and trying to get wallpaper off, if you're gonna re-wallpaper, is hard. But that's what it looks like. It's a very intentional discipline of re-wallpapering your mind. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Face the what ifs, even if you're afraid. Yeah, what if I start again and I fall again? Mm -hmm. What if I apply for that job that I thought I was supposed to go for and they tell me no? What if I start this? And, it, and to me, I used to think, well, I'll wait till I feel strong and courageous, but then yeah, I would wait forever because I'm not gonna feel strong and courageous. And sometimes that's what you do. You just do it afraid. 
Let go of what you can't control. <laughs> that would just be about everything. <laughs> we can control how things are in our house, our kids, everything. There comes a place where you realize you can't, but then you see the bigger picture. It's like allowing your children to make mistakes, accepting that your marriage won't be perfect or whatever relationship you're in, there's going to be things. Rise above disappointment. Let's face it, life is disappointing, but I have learned to embrace it. I've just finished, it won't come out until next year, but I finished writing a book on heaven. And the more I began to study about heaven, the more earth made sense to me. Because when a new heaven and a new earth comes down, we will live the life we were always supposed to. Amen. Two more, celebrate your scars and tattoos of triumph. If Christ chose to walk out of the tomb, still bearing the scars and the marks of, of crucifixion, why should I hide mine? To me, they're not open wounds anymore, they're scars. And scars are proof that God heals. Scars are not things to be hidden. Scars are tattoos of triumph. And finally, decide to start again and again. <laughs> yes. I think we need to have the grace that Christ gives us. You know, we are the only faith group on the planet where our leader shed his blood for us. Every other religion, you have to kind of shed your blood in one way or another to prove your worth. We have the only one where our Savior bled for us. So there's grace there to start again and again and again. Sheila's devotional is available wherever you purchase your reading material. It is a great read, even beyond the Christmas season. Still to come, she's a journalist, author, and pastor. I'm working on scripts at the moment. And for me, it is all about just developing. We can never learn too much about this industry. And I'm delighted that Michael's actually brought in a genre of different people and different diverse talents. We sit down with Carrie Lloyd to talk about her life and work. Welcome back to Studio 5. Carrie Lloyd is a pastor, author, and journalist. She's also worked in the film and television industry. And like Sheila Wall, she has some wisdom to jumpstart the new year. So we're here at the Echoes of Creation Conference. What is it that made you say yes to participating in a conference with young creatives? I actually, I've always loved this topic. It's my favorite topic, to be honest with you. Even though I've passed it and I've been involved in the Christian world, I came from a secular world. I was a hardcore atheist. And I always really revered the excellence and the brilliance of the craftsmanship of creatives within the secular world. But for me, it was really important that we actually started to build a bridge between some of the talent and the craft between the secular world and making sure that we can actually pour into the Christian. Because we're so, we're full of talent but we don't really give platforms or places really to give them a chance to actually give the risk and, the, and fighting for the courage to be able to try out new things. Um, and we are seeing in the industry now, more than ever before, some phenomenal pieces of work finally getting its sort of limelight into the mainstream. And I think it's got a, I think we've got a beautiful message to say and I think we need a bit more light. You being a pastor uh, and author yourself, what advice would you give to uh, a young writer who is thinking, I've got a book inside me, but I, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, as an author, when you start doing book signings, people come up to you and go, oh, I've got a book in you. Or you write the book that I wanted to write, <laughs> those kind of things. And so after I apologize, I then, <laughs> then yeah. say, you know what would be really interesting for us all to start with? And as I, I was a journalist before I started doing books, so the gift of asking the right questions and being curious, I think was probably one of the most powerful tools that helped me um, and sometimes we can get apathetic, either in our, it may be in our fear, maybe we've disqualified ourselves because we think the story's already be done. But you could talk about the same subject from 50,000 different angles and it's still a new story. So I think the gift of curiosity, really piercing into the questions of people's lives, biopics, documentaries, all those things where we're learning about life, people's stories, I think are a great place to start. Speaking of curiosity and asking um, the right questions, that inspired your latest book. I decided, well, it actually started with, again, curiosity. About five years ago, six years ago, I gave my mother an empty book, leather bound with her name engraved into it. And I said, Mama, I want you to write all the stories about your childhood, principles of your life, things that have got you through tough times. And I felt like we were going through, it seems that every single young generation berates and bemoans the older generation. 
and we've lost sometimes the opportunity of wisdom from them learning and living life even though we might think that they're backdated or they've fallen behind in progressive times I think actually we need to be learning from both their mistakes as well as their great learnings and so when mum handed me back this book I was like my gosh I thought I knew my mum inside out but I know just the surface level of my mother, my own mother. And so what it created then was, why don't we give this book a prompted journal that basically hands questions over, deep questions, journalistic questions. They're like, I'm not interested in what your favorite thing is for breakfast. I wanna know what was your darkest hour of your life and how did you get through it? And so it gives us the principles to live by and then that becomes our legacy. So we hand the book over to someone that inspires us. It doesn't have to be a parent, it can be a grandparent, it can be a spiritual mentor, a teacher, a coach give it to them for six months, a year, and then they give it back to you with the answers and you hold their legacy as a letter to you. And hopefully their pain is our gain in some way. And so that's why I did it. I thought we should just, I gained so much from my mother learning and listening to her wisdom that I just thought, oh, we can just make this into a book. It's the easiest book I've <laughs> ever written, but I've, I've loved hearing the stories from it. It's lovely to make the reader the writer for a change. Now, have you answered the questions yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> too terrified, too terrified to answer my own question. It was actually a test run actually on about on probably about 50 people that were the, over the age of 70. And there was one guy that said, you know, I, uh, I don't know whether I want to write about the affairs I had when I was younger. I, went, I, I totally get that. But wouldn't, wouldn't it be interesting for younger folk to learn why you had them? What was the revelation or the restoration that you needed to stop doing that? Carrie Lloyd has a podcast called The Carry On. You can find it wherever you stream your favorite podcasts. We've got to take a quick break, but before we do, it is time to share this week's story in pictures. Here's your Studio 5 snapshot. Based on Donald L. Miller's book, we take a look at Masters of the Air in pictures. The story follows the men of the 100th Bomb Group as they conduct perilous bombing raids over Nazi Germany and grapple with frigid conditions, lack of oxygen, and the sheer terror of combat from 25,000 feet in the air. Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg are the producers behind Masters of the Air coming to Apple TV January 26th. And this is your Studio 5 Snapshot Preview. Still ahead, Japanese pilot Mitsuo Fujita led the attack on Pearl Harbor, but then a change came. The more I dug through the dirt, the more little nuggets of gold I found. I thought, oh, you gotta be kidding me. The, the, oh, I cannot believe this. And I thought, oh man, the story just got better and better. For more on his transformation, author T. Martin Bennett joins us in Studio 5. Welcome back to Studio 5. These days, December 7th is dubbed National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. It is the day in 1941 when a Japanese ship launched a surprise attack against the United States. The attack was led by Japanese pilot Mitsuo Fuchida, but his life changed following that attack. Author T. Martin Bennett shares his story in the book Wounded Tiger. Author first come to this story because it obviously took some digging to make this all happen and be a book. Yeah, it's a. It, so I've always loved true stories from an early age, Ephraim, mm -hmm. and I had come across a used book online mm -hmm. of this guy, mm -hmm. and I know quite a bit about World War II, the Pacific War. I know a lot of redemption stories, lives changed. I never heard anything about this guy's life, mm -hmm. so I spent three years in research on this, Ephraim, and uh, the more I dug through the dirt. The more little nuggets of gold I found, I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. The, the, oh, I cannot believe this. And I thought, oh, man, the story just got better and better. So that's how I got on the track. But I did spend a good bit of time tracking down all these bits and pieces that were scattered all over the world. Without giving too much away, because we want people to read the book and see the movie when that time does come. But we're talking about like three narratives here. Yeah. So the story of Wounded Tiger is three plot lines. 
-hmm. And the first, the primary line, is the one about Mitsuo Fuchida, the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, who was mm -hmm. handpicked by Admiral Yamamoto, hated the United States, wanted the glory of Japan. You know, that's what he was fighting for, his own selfish ambition, ambition for his nation. That's about 50% of the story. Mm -hmm. Then about 30% is a guy named Jake DeShazer. He was an American who joined the Army, ended up in the U.S. Army Air Corps, and he volunteered to attack Japan in a secret mission that he knew nothing about. He had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So they dropped bombs on Japan. He was the bombardier who actually dropped the bombs. Mm -hmm. And then their plane was heading to China, which we were, was our ally in World War II. But only part of China was occupied by the Japanese, and uh, the rest of it was the Chinese. Their plane ran out of fuel. He bails out. He becomes a prisoner of the Japanese, tortured, buddies killed, uh, died of, of exposure, solitary confinement. It was hell on earth for him. Mm -hmm. The third plot line are the Covells. They're highly educated teachers from Chicago, and they love the Japanese people. They love God. They went to the poor sections of the town, help people, medical care, feed them, and teach them the good news about the Lord. How these stories develop and how they come together, odds are millions to yeah. one that any of these things would happen the way it happens. And it's a very rewarding story. People who have no interest in religion, God, Jesus, church, nothing. I mean, zero, even anti-Christian people. Read the book, One Woman Told Me With Tears Rolling Down Her Face. Unbelievable story. In the story, we see hate, vengeance, and redemption. Absolutely. And, and the, you know, the world is, is, has been at war uh, since the beginning of man. We're seeing it today in the news every day, killing, fighting. You know, who has more power here? But Fuchida, and I got this in his own writings, that he said, you know, war begins in the heart. Therefore, peace must begin in the heart. It's not a matter of who has the biggest guns. It's a matter of allowing yourself and seeking the pathway to peace. Mm -hmm. And how that happens in his life and in DeShazer's life and in the Covell's lives and how this girl, Peggy Covell, in upstate New York becomes the fulcrum of change in Fuchida's life. How these things happen are mind boggling. We wouldn't be sitting here today if these people had not just said yes to God in a small way first. How has this book and this journey changed you? Well, it's changed me in that it set the bar a lot higher on what we shoot for in life. Simple acts done in obedience and love can have monumental impacts on other people and the planet itself. You don't have to do big, crazy stuff to have an impact on this world in a positive way. So our small choices every day, they could have giant ramifications. And so I, I take my life a bit more seriously. And I, I just felt the Lord say, Martin, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart, how can the love of God be in him? I feel like the Lord say, Martin, raise the bar. I'm helping you. You help other people. You don't know who you're going to meet and what they're going to be in, in the future. Help everybody. Love everybody. So that's the question I have now. I say, Lord, how can I help this person? Wounded Tiger is available right now wherever you purchase your reading material. Welcome back to Studio 5. Music helps us to bring you this show every single week, and this week's soundtrack comes from Maroon 5. Take a listen, and you'll hear why Middle Ground is what's playing in my ear this week. Well, on that musical note, we are just about out of time for this week's edition of Studio 5. So let's take a quick look at what we have in store on next week's rundown. People said my family was cursed. Mom tried to protect us with God. Pop tried to protect us with wrestling. He said if we were the toughest, the strongest, nothing had ever hurt us. It's the true story of the Von Erich brothers who made history in the world of professional wrestling. A story of trial, triumph, and tragedy. It's it's complicated family dynamics. It is generational trauma and this notion of a curse and what that really means. Um, and you know, questioning 
where we come from and what we believe. Iron Claw stars Harris Dickerson, Jeremy Allen White, and Zac Efron. The support and true love between the brothers, that was really special. It didn't feel like any other film I've ever worked on before. The film's director is in Studio 5 for a behind-the-scenes look at the story. Hey, be sure and join us for that story and so much more come next week. As for this week, you've got time for just one more moment in the show. We want to give that time the final word to Sheila Walsh. Understand that you are loved, that you're seen, that you're known, and, and you don't have to get it all right. It's not about you getting it all right. It's about finally understanding that you'll never get it right but that because of Jesus. I mean, when I think of, it's interesting, I was doing research for a book and I came across some old tax documents that would have been around about the time when Christ was on the earth and stamped on them was the word tetelestai. It is finished, bill paid in full. And when I began to understand that I don't have to pay the bill for my own life, that Christ has already paid it, start there and be honest. Don't pretend you're fine. Tell Jesus the whole truth. He modeled that for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't, that night, he didn't say, well, Lord, this has always been the plan. Father, let's go, let's do this thing. He was in so much agony that he literally, as Luke, the doctor tells us, sweat blood. That still exists, it's called hematohydrosis. And the only place it shows up is when people are walking to be executed. It's when you are in the most extreme stress and pain of your life. Literally, that's what Christ shed blood first before the cross. And he told his father, if there was any other way, take this away from me. So when you pour out your pain in the presence of your father, you make space for grace. Sheila Walsh, that's a great final word for this edition of Studio 5 and this week's look at uplifting entertainment. Until next time, make time to uplift someone around you and then please come on back. See where Studio 5 takes you next week. God bless you. Thank you for watching.